What I thought I'd do today is talk about two of the biggest challenges of our time. The first being public debt, uh, which is a huge problem in most of the advanced economies today, uh, the burden of public debt. And the second issue is climate change. And you may well ask, what do these two very big, difficult, long-term issues have in common? Well, they have several things in common. One, they, um, they are very big, long-term problems in which policymakers have to persuade publics to make big short-term sacrifices for long-term gains. I'm going to use the example of energy subsidies to illustrate, uh, to illustrate this case. Um, to illustrate, because energy subsidy is at the intersection of how to reduce public's public debt, because energy subsidies are a huge bur burden on budgets in many countries. And it's also a, a key part of addressing the climate change issue. Now let me first start by asking the question, why do governments subsidize energy? And the answer is pretty simple. We all love cheap energy. Energy is a huge part of all of our lives. We consume it every day in lots of different ways. And you can see the political appeal of keeping energy prices very cheap. That particular political appeal has led to the fact that most countries in the world subsidize energy. We've just put out a very interesting survey which looks at 176 countries around the world and found that the global cost of energy subsidies uh, in 2011 was $1.9 trillion. That's a big number. Let me put that into some perspective. That's 2.5% of total world output. It's 8% of what governments spend in the world. So it's a very, very big number. And yet, despite this very common practice, we all know that energy subsidies are not smart policies. They're not smart policies for three reasons. First, they're not very well targeted to the poor. We know that the people who consume energy the most tend to be the better off. In emerging markets and developing countries, 43% of energy subsidies before tax go to the richest 20% of the population. So that's one reason. The second reason is that energy subsidies crowd out other much more worthwhile public spending, like spending on education or infrastructure, which is far more needed. And the third reason is that it encourages people to use too much energy because it's artificially cheap. Our estimates are that if you eliminated energy subsidies globally, you would reduce ca global carbon emissions by about 4.5 billion tons, or a 13% reduction in global carbon emissions. Now, because of all of those reasons, many countries have realized that it's important to reduce subsidies. Let me give you some examples from just two regions. One, the Middle East and North Africa, which of all regions in the world subsidize energy more than anyone else. Countries in that, about half the countries in the Middle East and North Africa spend about 5% of GDP on energy subsidies. The, the oil exporting countries in the region do it as a way to share the wealth with their population. The oil importing countries do it as a way to provide a sort of safety net where, because they don't have proper social safety nets and welfare systems in place. So this is a way to transfer benefits directly to a large part of the population, albeit inefficiently. Now, the burden of those costs has borne very heavily on countries in the Middle East and North Africa recently. And they've all tried to reduce subsidies in some ways, but have made very limited progress, mainly because they've not been very successful at overcoming the resistance uh, in, in populations, both by vested interests, by households, often because they're not persuaded by the government's case. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. You see a similar phenomenon in sub-Saharan Africa, where, again, many countries spend 3 to 4% of GDP on energy subsidies. That's about the same as they're spending on health care, just to give you an order of magnitude. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's particularly sad because resources are scarce, but also it's a continent which has huge comparative advantage in renewable energy. And as long as fossil fuels are subsidized, the incentive to develop those alternative renewable energies is far less, and fossil fuel dependency continues. But the problem of energy subsidy also exists in rich countries. In fact, the advanced economies uh, are the ones who undertax en uh, energy more, more than anyone. The US alone accounts for about one fourth of the global undertaxation of, of the energy sector. Having said that, eliminating energy subsidies is not impossible. 
The work that we did actually looked at 19 country case studies that were successful at eliminating energy subsidies. And there's some very clear lessons from those experiences. We identified six key elements of success. First, you need a comprehensive reform program. You need to be able to tell people where you're going in the medium term. And you need to assess the impact and consult along the way. Second, you need a very good communication strategy. And that communication strategy needs to build both understanding and support for reform, emphasizing not just the costs of subsidies, but also the potential benefits of removal. Third, you need measures to compensate the poor. Uh, and you need, to, you need to show very clearly how that will happen. We tend to prefer targeted cash transfers uh, or near cash transfers like vouchers to do that. Uh, but if you don't have systems in place to do that, other ways of subsidizing the poor, like subsidizing mass transit, for example, can work. The fourth key uh, common theme of successful reforms is phasing. Abrupt, sharp rises in prices uh, don't give households and firms time to adjust and react. And allowing businesses and, and households time to adjust to higher prices is, is important. So phasing it in slowly over time is very, very important. The, the fifth sort of key lesson is improving the efficiency of state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises, particularly power companies, uh, are big beneficiaries of energy subsidies. And unless you improve their efficiency, it's very hard to get the benefits from reform. And then finally, you need to find a way to depoliticize price setting so that over the, f over the future, when prices go up and down, you have an automatic mechanism whereby world prices get translated into domestic prices, sometimes with a lag, again, to give people time to adjust so you don't have sharp up and downs depending on volatile world prices, but some unpolitical automatic formula uh, that makes sure that prices stay at, uh, at reasonable levels. So I hope I've persuaded you that there's a sound case for reforming energy subsidies. I think there's a rich background of country experiences and lessons to be learned about how the case can be made, how the public can be persuaded uh, that it's possible, and how those that would be most negatively affected could be compensated. I always remember once I, uh, someone who was a, an advisor to a very senior politician once said to me, politicians always overestimate what they can achieve in the short run and underestimate what they can achieve in the long run. It is possible to make big impacts on reducing public debt, on affecting climate change in the long run, if one makes, does the sort of serious homework in the shorter term and in the nearer term. I think if we don't, if we don't make that effort, we will saddle future generations with a huge burden of both debt and a climate that's permanently damaged as a result of it. So the case, I think, is incredibly strong. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.